Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be a real inspiration to you out in the radio listening audience as well as you here in the auditorium. And if you'll get on the phone out there and call a friend and have them to tune in, especially a shut-in, you'll be doing them a favor, and we appreciate that so very much. Take your Bible, turn to Ruth chapter 1, page 315 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm going to bring message number 14 today from the book of Ruth. I want you to turn to chapter 1. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, you tune to the station where you're now listening out in the radio listening audience, then you get our daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday. Now tape today will be tape number 275. Tape number 275. We have more than 250 tape listed. Be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape. They are $3 each, and then what you give for these tape helps take care of our radio expense. Would you miss our broadcast if you didn't, if you didn't hear it on the air? This is our 39th year of data broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. And I'm sure many of you would miss it if you didn't hear it. Many of you have parents and grandparents gone on to be with the Lord and enjoyed our ministry in days gone by. And I covet your prayers. I want you to write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Quite often we get letters from people that's been saved as a result of the radio ministry. And many that receive blessings from the broadcast, not only on the Lord's Day, but throughout the week. Now, next Sunday, of course, Easter. We're looking forward to a good attendance. I hope you'll be here if you possibly can. Remember, Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. He's placed in the grave sometime around probably 6 o'clock, end of the day. And then he remained in the grave three days and three nights. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, that Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. So must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Jesus in the grave Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. He was in the grave Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. At the end of the Sabbath, on Saturday around 6 o'clock in the evening, he came out of the grave. Nice, it had been impossible. Oh, you say, now, preacher, does the Bible say the next day was a Sabbath? Yes. But what a lot of people don't know is it was an annual Sabbath. In John chapter 19 and verse 31, John said that particular Sabbath was a high day. That meant it was more than a weekly Sabbath. If you read Leviticus chapter 23, you'll see there other Sabbaths mentioned. And this happened to be one of the annual Sabbaths. It fell on Thursday. And the next day was a Sabbath day. And so was Saturday a weekly Sabbath. But Jesus came out at the end of the weekly Sabbath on Saturday, the end of the Sabbath day, around 6 in the evening. You need to read your Bible, study the Word of God, and Quit following the theories and ideas of men and find out what God has to say from the book. And then you'll be safe. A lot of people just go along with what they hear and what others teach without searching the scriptures. That's why I want you to bring your Bibles when you come to church here on Sunday. Always glad to see you bring that book. Dwight L. Moody said the greatest sermon he ever saw was a man going down the road with a Bible under his arm. Don't ever be ashamed of that blessed book. Bring it to the house of God. And when we preach, you follow me in the scriptures. See whether or not I'm preaching what well, thus saith the Lord God. I want you to do that. And so I want you to turn now to Ruth chapter 1. 
I want to read a few verses. I'm going to speak on this line of thought. Ruth on the road to redemption. This will be message number 14. Ruth on the road to redemption. We're going to present her as a type of a sinner that comes to know God. In the book of Ruth chapter 1, and beginning with verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from falling after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Now Ruth is saying here that she's going on with Naomi back to Bethlehem, Judah. The Bible said when Naomi saw she meant business, she said, all right, come along with me. And they went down the road together. We have brought 13 messages from the book of Ruth, and I mentioned many of these wonderful truths. In the message, we shall consider Ruth as a type of a sinner in his progress from sin to salvation. I want you to see this today. I want you to realize that salvation is of the Lord. God Almighty tells us salvation is in a person, that person is Jesus Christ. And you need to realize that. Now, speaking about Ruth, let me mention several things about her and watch this and see her as a type of a sinner coming to know God. Number one, as a sinner, she frequented Boaz's house. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 7, as she said, I pray ye, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from morning until now, and she tarried a little in the house. I don't know a better place to hear the word of God than in the house of God. Many of you have been saved in the building called the house of God, the church. We know the true born again believers constitute the real true church. We know that, but we believe strongly in the local assembly and the place where we meet to worship. And I don't know a better place to find God than to come to the house of God and hear the word of God. It was here that Ruth really became acquainted with Boaz. She toiled out in the field and as she went to the house, his house there, the tent or whatever it was, she became acquainted with Boaz. It was here that she received instruction from him. He engaged her in a conversation about various things, no doubt. It is here that she communed with the reapers. There were reapers there in the field. They were reaping the grain and she communed with them. Now we should strive to get sinners to the house of God. If you get somebody to the house of God and they get saved, I believe God will credit you as having a part in winning those people to God or that person. Many years ago, I was in a meeting not too far from here. Back in the days when you could have meetings and fill the house up. A man came to that meeting, wore his overalls every night, which was all right. He drove an A-model Ford. That man got saved. And all during that meeting, he would go out and bring people in. He'd load his automobile down with people, pack them in there and bring them to the meeting. Eighteen people that he brought to that meeting found the Lord Jesus Christ. In that two-week survival, we had five young men to surrender to preach the gospel. That man that drove that A-model Ford, that man that was overhauls to church every night, was a soul winner. He might not have been able to teach or sing or be able to explain much about the Bible, but he knew God, and he knew if he got people there and they heard the word of God, God could speak to them, and that he did. Every one of us ought to try to get people to the house of God. Somebody says, well, that's a preacher's job. No, that's your job, to get people in here and win them to Jesus. Sheep produce sheep, not the shepherd. And you're the sheep. You need to get out and get others in and get them saved to the glory of God. Number two, as a stranger, she found his grace. The Bible says in verses 2 and 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger. That's chapter 2 and verse 10. As a stranger, 
she found his grace. Now there are three items related to the grace here in the Bible. That's the God of grace, the throne of grace, and the spirit of grace mentioned in the word of God. Now we see it originated by the God of grace. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. As a stranger she found the grace of God. As a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, you found Jesus Christ as a stranger by the grace of God. Night is also obtained from the throne of God. Not only is it originated by the God of grace, it's obtained from the throne of God. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are urged to come boldly to this throne of grace. Number three is offered by the spirit of grace. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. And hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Here we see the trinity at work in regard to uh, salvation. The trinity has the part in your salvation. You need to realize that. Number three, as a daughter, she felt his love. She felt the love of Boaz as a daughter. He referred to her as daughter. In chapter 2 and verse 13, then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. For thou hast comforted me. Now these words are equivalent to saying, I have felt thy love. Here we find that Ruth felt the love of Boaz. Now you can feel the love of the Lord Jesus if you are surrendered to God. I know you can. It's not like the love of this world, but it's a different kind of love, real true love of the Lord Jesus. The love of Christ is found three times in the Bible. And while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He loved us, the Bible tells us. And then the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. No unsaved person loves God. The only way you can love the Lord is by the Spirit of God dwelling in you and bringing about that love for the Lord Jesus. It is inconceivable in its estimation because in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19, he says to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Our finite minds cannot comprehend the depths of God's wonderful love. It's imperative in its operation because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth me, so saith the Bible. Although our finite minds cannot comprehend the love of God, we know it's His love that constrains us. Number three is inseparable in its manifestation. In Romans chapter 5, 8 and verse 35, the Bible said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or necklace, or pearl, or sword? That's says no. That's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So as a daughter, she felt the love of Boaz. As a child of God, you can feel the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and soul. If you can't, there's something wrong. Because God loves his people. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That you need to realize. So we thank God for his wonderful love for poor lost sinners. Had not God loved me, I would not be saved today. But God loved me enough to lay down his life for us, to die for us on Calvary's cross. We come to thought number four, and that is, as a Glena, she followed his word. There's nothing any more sweet and blessed to a Christian than the word of God. I thank God for this blessed book. A lamp under my feet and a light under my pathway. Great preacher said one time, when he died, he'd like to pillar his head on the word of God. This is the greatest book in all the world. You'll never find another like it. It's a wonderful, wonderful word of God. And as you study and read this book and meditate and cogitate upon the word of God, you can find the word of God burning in your bosom like the two men on the road to Emmaus as Jesus talked to them that day when they discovered later who he was. 
They said, did not our heart burn within us as he, we talked with him along the way? Jesus explained who he was, and that is, prosperity to him as he traveled down that Emmaus road. Just a few weeks ago, we traveled that Emmaus road. We went down to Emmaus, and I thought about that scripture as we went down the Emmaus road. As Athena, she followed his word. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 3, we find the prophet said, Then did I eat it. It was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Ezekiel said, I did eat the word of God. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. Oh, you say, preacher, how can I eat the word of God? You eat the word of God by reading, by cogitating, by meditating upon this blessed book. Read the Bible. Read again. Take the word of God, chew it over and over again as it were, and enjoy the blessed book. Many of you go week after week and never crack the Bible. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to read this book every day, every day. I try to read my Bible every day. I'm not saying this in a braggadocious way, but I've read this book through many times. I've read it through my knees, forward and backward. I started on my knees reading so one time many years ago the Bible from the book of Genesis. On my knees, I read it completely through the book of Revelation, all the way through the Bible, not at one time, of course. When I read it through on my knees, I said, I'm going to take it verse by verse and read it backward. I read the Bible all the way backward from Revelation back through Genesis on my knees. That doesn't mean I know a whole lot about the Bible. I don't. You never draw this well dry. It's a deep well. And every time you come up with fresh water, there's more waiting for you. You can read a chapter and say, well, I've exhausted that chapter. No, no. You kind of exhaust the word of God. You go down in the word of God and keep digging out. And you find new nuggets and fresh water from the blessed scriptures. Read it and reread it and read it again. And keep on reading this book. Let it become a part of you. Simulate the scriptures. And you grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reason you have so many church members today that are carnal. And so many Christians that never grow. They do not feed upon the wonderful word. You have seven uh, phrases here of words of sweetness to the weary Lena. Number one is a word of affection. In John chapter 15 and verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Look at those words. Wonderful words of sweetness to the weary gleaner. As the Father loved me, so I love, I love you, said Jesus. Then secondly, you have the word of forgiveness. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 48, he said, Thy sins are forgiven. See, Jesus was God. He could forgive sins. Number three, you have the words of cheer. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now before you have the word of grace. In John chapter 8 and verse 11. Neither I condemn thee. Sin no more. Said Jesus to this poor fallen woman. There you have the words of grace. Then number five. You have the words of comfort. You read John chapter 14. And the first three verses. You know them I'm sure many of you by memory. What Jesus speaks about in my father's house. Of many mentions. There you have words of comfort that Jesus can convey, convey into the hearts of his disciples and to our hearts today. Then you have the words of hope in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. He's coming and he's coming quickly, he tells us. Then number 7, you have the words of victory. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. There you have the words of victory coming from our dear Savior. We are victorious in Him. There's no reason for you to live a defeated life. The Bible says, Great is He that's in you than He that's in the world. You have the overcomer dwelling in you, and you can overcome. You can be victorious. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to sit around on the juniper tree. You can be an overcomer. You have the promise in the Word of God, the Spirit of God. Living and dwelling in your heart. 
Then we come to thought number five, and that is, as a worshiper, she fell at his feet. Here we find Ruth falling down at the feet of Boaz, a type of a sinner bowing down before Jesus, as it were, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 10, then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. I like to see people humble themselves before God. I like to even see lost sinners when they come to be saved, bow before God as it were, humble their hearts, repenting, sorry of their sins, and believing on Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Bible says she bowed down, she fell down before him to the ground. She fell on her face. Here Ruth is bowing down, falling on her face. Here before this man Boaz, which is the type of Jesus Christ. So she bows down before him. We find in the Bible that Mary Magdalene stood at his feet weeping. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 38. And then we find the demonic sat down at his feet in Luke chapter 8 and verse 35. Then we find this Aphrodisian woman worshipped at his feet. So you can come and bow down. You can stand. You can worship as it were at the feet of Jesus. Like these people of old. I still like to see people humble themselves before God. If they really mean business, they'll feel that they should come forward and humble themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ and worship Him. Now, she fell on her face before the Lord. I believe with all my heart, before any sinner ever comes to know God, there must be that convicting power of the Holy Spirit to convict that lost man of his sins. And let him know he needs God and he's on the road to hell. And when a man realizes that, you have some hope of getting that person to God. I've seen people who are persuaded to make a profession. It doesn't amount to a thing in the world. You can twist people's arms, drag them down the altar, and force a profession out of them. You don't have a convert. You have someone that came forward because they felt obligated to others to do so. When a person walks down the aisle of a church under conviction, realizing he needs God Almighty, and really under repentance and conviction of sin and get right with God, you have a convert. Many times those people are saved. Ere they get up out of their seat, God sees them mean business. But yet they come on down and bow, and there maybe pray the sinner's prayer, or repent and trust Jesus Christ fully with their heart and soul. Number six, as a handmaid, she fed at his feet. In chapter 2 and verse 14, she sat beside the reapers. He reached her parched corn and she did eat and was advice and left. As a handmaid, as a handmaid, notice she fed at his feet. As God's children today, when we come to know the Lord, we should feed upon the word of God, as it were, at the feet of Jesus. We'll eat and drink at his table, of course, in the kingdom. The Bible tells us. Remember in the Bible, in the, uh, the, the second Samuel chapter 9, we have a man there by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, a cripple, came and sat at King David's banquet table. And there he had his feet under the table. He is a deformed man. He's deformed because a nurse had let him fall and cripple him when he was just a baby. And there he sat at the king's table. They didn't gaze upon his deformed limbs. They went to the table. He was sitting there like the son of David and ate at the table. I'm glad we have a God today that when he saves a sinner, God doesn't hold his past life against him. God doesn't say, you old drunkard, or you old harlot, or whoremong, a thief, or robber, and continually uh, throw that at you and accuse you of being such. No, no. No, no. When you come to know God, you're somebody. You're in the family of God. And God drops a curtain on your past life. And God remembers your sins against you no more. And you start a new record the moment you're born into the family of God. And we need to realize that as a sojourn. Then number seven, as a bride, she finished his plan. In chapter 2 and verse 21, Thou shalt keep fast by the young men 
or they have ended all my harvest. Here they made plans. God has a plan. He knows the ending from the beginning. God knows these he selects out and places in his temple. Building the temple of God. God has a plan now and for the future. And always had a plan. And so they had a plan and they finished that plan. Boaz told her what to do. Naomi instructed her as to what to do. And she did it. Boaz had a plan. Our Lord has a plan. And we saw in chapter 4 here a couple of weeks ago. About what happened whenever they consummated the plan that they had talked about and planned in the scriptures. We find our Lord has a plan. He should be satisfied. Our Lord's plan is he should be satisfied with his church that he's redeemed. That's the plan of God. He's going to be satisfied with it. He should be satisfied with the accomplishment of his death. Jesus Christ was satisfied with what he did on Calvary. Then he should be satisfied with the work of his intercession. Now at the right hand of the Father, he makes intercession for us. He's satisfied with that. He should be satisfied with his thousand years reign on the earth. When he comes back to set up his kingdom. He should be satisfied with the restoration of the heavens and the earth. The new heavens and the new earth. He should be satisfied with the punishment of Satan and the wicked. He should be satisfied with his bride of which Ruth is a type. Dear soul, today if you've been born into God's great family. You're part of the bride of Jesus Christ to be. Somewhere you've been placed in that body. Somewhere as a little stone you've been placed in that temple. God doesn't see your past life anymore. God sees you in Christ as though you'd never sin. As though you never will sin again. That's where God sees his children in Christ Jesus. You ought to praise the Lord that you're saved. Many years ago, young boy wounded over in Vietnam came back to California. His parents knew nothing about the seriousness of his uh, wound, what happened there. And after spending much time in the hospital, he came back to California. His parents lived in one of the northern cities. When he arrived there in California, he went to a hotel and got on the phone. He called his mother and dad. And he said, I'm back in the States. And I'm coming home. They said, son, we're so glad that you're back home. We want to see you so badly. But he said, uh, mama, daddy, could I bring a friend with me when I come? Well, they said, uh, we just like you to come. But if you have a friend that, that you can bring, all right, I, I suppose it'd be all right. Maybe he'll fit in the family, all right. He said, uh, he said mama said, uh, this friend I'm going to bring back only has one eye. She said, well, I don't know how that would fit in with the family, but I don't know about that, son. He said, mother said, not only that, but said, this friend I'm going to bring back only has one arm. Oh, she said, son, that, that would certainly be a misfit in our family. That would be an enormous. I, I just, uh, I don't know about that, son. He said, not only that, mother, but said, this friend would have only one leg. Say so he lost an eye, he lost an arm, and he lost a leg in Vietnam. The mother and dad said, son, you come on home, but don't bring that person. He'd be a handicap and a hindrance. We don't want him here. We want you. You come on home, don't bring that friend. And he hung up. The next day, a message was sent to his parents. They said, we have a body. A boy jumped out of the window here in the hotel. He only had one eye, he had one leg, and he had one arm. And said, that boy is your son. Do you want his body? That poor boy called home because he was afraid he wouldn't fit back in the family with one eye, one leg, and one arm. And when he found out they didn't want a person like that in the family, he committed suicide. I'm glad that when Jesus saves us, he blots out all sins. And regardless of our past, he doesn't hold them against us anymore. Thank God for his marvelous grace. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll take the message, that you'll use it. 
That your name might be honored. That Jesus might be glorified. See in Ruth here's a type. Of a sinner coming to know thee. We're so glad our father. That one day you found us. Saved us. Washed us with your precious blood. Now God I pray today. That someone. Might come to know the Savior. As a result of this service today. In the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. As David plays. On the organ here for just a moment or two. If you're in this building. And you're unsaved. You want to come to know God. Come down here and let us help you. If you're in this building. You once knew the Lord. But you're out of fellowship with God. Come let us help you. If you're in this building. And you want to join this church in the way we receive members. Then you may come and present yourself. We present you before the church. Or for any other reason. That you feel you want to come forward on. I want you to do it. By the way patiently. While she plays a couple of stanzas, would you come? Now's your opportune time.